the original idea of this uh, meeting was to really examine the, the current state of play with the uh, Lord's Resistance Army, uh, looking at uh, the past three or four months in terms of the evolution of the organization to ask the question, uh, what, what, is, what are its prospects? Is it is what we're, we've seen in these three months the last uh, kicks of a dying horse, or are we seeing a regrouping and a splintering and, and, and yet worse to come? And uh, in the last few weeks, I'm sure you've all heard ab about the resupply of the Lord's Resistance Army and, we've, and the continuing attacks by uh, its adherents. Um, so to help us try and unpick this uh, puzzle, we've got a really eminent team tonight. Uh, now, on my, my far right, which has no political connotations, I assure you, uh, Mr. <laughs> Barney uh, Afako, who is a uh, specialist on the, uh, on the legal and human rights side of, of, the, of the story. He's going to take us through the, the details of the peace negotiations, the media, mediation involved. Uh, Annecke von Wudenberg, uh, who is uh, a longtime uh, campaigner uh, and uh, commentator on uh, both the Congo and, um, and uh, Uganda and Sudan. And uh, she's going to take us through the regional uh, and the, the military activities. Uh, and on my, on, on my immediate left is Peter Eichstadt from the Institute of War and Peace Reporting. Uh, who has followed the, uh, the LRA's activities in great detail, having recently been in the region. And he's going to uh, talk very directly to the, the issue of the current status of the, uh, of the, uh, of the organization. And on my far left is Joseph uh, Ocheno, who is the UK British representative of the uh, UPC, Uganda People's Congress, which is one of the leading uh, political parties, opposition political parties in, in, in Uganda. And he's going to talk very much about the, uh, the domestic uh, level of this crisis uh, and what it says about the, the orientation of the Museveni government. But all, all four panelists are going to intervene, and we do want you to do the same. And the format is really we're going to go around the panel uh, one by one, and each one of the panelists is going to, uh, going to lead on a particular subject speak at length, and then I'm going to ask the other panels to contribute, and then throw that open to the floor, and then we'll get on to the next one. So uh, do, uh, don't hesitate to come up with your own views. But what, what we would like are sort of terse, quick questions rather than, in fact, definitely not long political statements, but terse <laughs> political uh, questions uh, to, and really sort of try and get the, uh, tease the expertise out of our, our panel. So I'd very much like to start uh, with, with you, Barney, yes. and, and, and if you could try and bring us up to date in terms of the efforts to get the peace talks going last year, uh, and what the objectives were and what the methods were, and, and why you think uh, they didn't amount to uh, anything in the end, and, and we've, they were broken off and we're now with this crisis we now face. Yes. I think the place to start with, uh, with the talks is, is further than 2006 when the Juba talks actually commenced. Uh, if you look back through the history of the insurgency of the LRA, the government has responded usually by military means, but interspersed in between uh, military efforts to deal with the LRA have been offers for talks and uh, successive talks starting with with 2004, going back before that to 1994, did not yield uh, any lasting agreement. Uh, the, the last main military push was in 2002, when with the agreement of the government of Sudan, an operation called Iron Fist saw Ugandan forces go into southern Sudan. At that time, with the objective of routing the LRA once and for all. Of course, that only resulted in the LRA returning to Uganda with, with, with a vengeance and, and uh, allegedly committing uh, very, very serious crimes. Uh, and so frustration again for the Ugandan military. But, uh, but surprisingly, in 2004, again, the, 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 the government, uh, through the mediation of, of Betty Bigombe, um, pursued uh, another, yet another attempt to talk to the LRA. But just before it did that, the, the, the government had decided to play the international justice card and referred its own situation to the International Criminal Court. 
So by the time Betty Bigombe arrived, there was already a justice process that was going on uh, in, in, in The Hague and, uh, and with uh, Mr. Ocampo taking a keen interest in the situation in northern Uganda. So already at that time, that was seen as a complicating matter. Uh, those talks came to very little. And uh, although drafts of an agreement were, were, were discussed, it, it all appeared rather rushed, and, and, and there was no deal. So why Juba in 2006? Uh, the, the explanation is the comprehensive peace agreement. Juba now had uh, self-government. They, they, they now were governing uh, a, a large part of, of their own issues. And, and it was felt in Juba that, that having the LRA still in the country was what was a huge security risk. And, and that led to, uh, to President uh, Salva Kiir prevailing upon President Museveni in, in Uganda to allow his government to mediate. But in fact, it wasn't President Salva Kiir's idea. This is an old idea that, that even uh, uh, John Garang had, uh, had nurtured and had been discussing uh, that there should be a settlement like they'd had a settlement uh, with, with Khartoum. Uganda should have a settlement with the LRA so that there would be a, a, a comprehensive and neat tying up of this insurgency which was costing southern Sudan quite a lot and risking uh, a, a lot of issues uh, to do with the CPA. So that's why uh, we, we, I would say that President Museveni agreed to that, uh, to, to that process and sent uh, his delegation. Uh, the, the, the approach to the negotiations took the government of Uganda by surprise, I think. I think the, 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 the mediator and his team decided that as far as possible, they should go for a, a complete and, and comprehensive agreement. Therefore, on the agenda, it wasn't just the question of a ceasefire and disarmament, but it, it, it started by looking after the cessation of hostilities by looking at what was called comprehensive solutions. Why was there a conflict in northern Uganda? What have been its impacts? And how do we correct uh, the, the causes and ameliorate the impacts of the conflict? And that, at first, was resisted by the government delegation because they didn't think that the LRA ought to be discussing root causes and, and, and impacts. But in the end, uh, I, I believe that the, even the government uh, came round to uh, rather grudgingly initially to, to accepting that these matters needed to be discussed. Of course, there will be a debate as to how, how, how far uh, the, the, the negotiations went into this, but that was one of the agenda items. The other agenda items had to do with the usual package of demobilization and, and, um, uh, and reintegration and return of people, of course, a, a, a ceasefire, but very key. Uh, because of the whole international justice issue, was uh, an agenda item on accountability and reconciliation. What was attempted with that was to deal with the whole question of, of international arrest warrants, which had by this time been made public after having been issued in July 2005. But throughout the talks, uh, even though progress was made on some of the other issues, the question of what will happen to the leaders of the LRA should they disarm uh, became uh, a sticking one. And although it was deferred time and again, it kept coming back uh, because uh, the leadership of the LRA was not happy with the idea of international prosecutions and wanted to see whether there would be an alternative in Uganda that, that was uh, even-handed that made sure that crimes committed by both sides would be looked at. So that was a difficult uh, issue to, to reach agreement on. But in the end, what was agreed was that there would be established a, a national court, a division of the high court, which would deal with all the crimes committed during the conflict, not just since 2002, but, but since the inception of the, of the conflict in northern Uganda and that this would happen in, in, in Kampala, and the government would take steps to, to persuade the, the judges that that was sufficient and there was no need for the ICC uh, issue to go forward. Uh, there was a question about sequencing. The, 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 the LRA started coming back to say, we want some kind of guarantee now because of the Charles Taylor precedent, and, and all of these Congolese are being taken to The Hague 
Bemba towards the end or was in the Hague and, and, and of course they're all aware of, of this issue. What guarantees there for us was, was the question. And that, that became a recurring issue in, 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 at the end of, uh, in, in April, Joseph Kony did not turn up to, to sign the agreement, although everything was done and dusted and bound up, waiting for signatures, and raised new issues about the accountability point and wanted to be clear about what uh, would, would, uh, would be an offer for his forces and his people should they return. Would there be an education? Would they be reintegrated? Would they be incorporated into the army? So, and all the other successive attempts to, to try to get these issues resolved, and this involved elders and community leaders, uh, didn't really come to, to, to anything. And in the meantime, Kampala was getting impatient. Uh, the government of the United States was getting extremely impatient as well. I think they lost patience uh, before the end of 2008. And, uh, and, and when you had one, one non-signature after another, of course, on the military side, preparations were being made. And the last fling of the dice was at, at the end of November 2008. We all went back to, 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 to the border with Congo to try to see if there would be a signature this time. All the governments in the region uh, were, were hoping for a signature. Certainly, President Kabila was hoping that there would be a signature so that, so, so that things would advance and the LRA would assemble. And, and the process would kick in. But in the end, that signature was not obtained. And, and only a couple of weeks later, the, the military operation, which obviously had been in the planning for some time, uh, kicked off. And, and I think that's, that, that, that's where things are now. And I'll come back on, on the other issues later. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it'd be good to sort of then pull apart, you know, what was wrong with that process and how might it be improved. Uh, um, just can I just go around the other members of the panel and just mm. get very quick reactions? Mm. Do you think there was a fundamental flaw with the process? I mean, was it the personalities? Was it the process? Was it? I think, from our perspective, so Human Rights Watch, yeah. who followed this process also very closely, obviously from from a justice perspective, there were a number of key issues, and I won't go through all of those at the moment. But one was that throughout the entire peace process, of course, the LRA continued to commit abuses. Now, the LRA had moved into um, northern Congo to Garamba National Park, one of the national parks in northern Congo, in late 2005. And I think one thing that, that Barney forgot to mention, which I think also pushed them actually towards peace talks, was a failed military operation by the United Nations in, uh, so just a few months after the LRA had moved into Congo. One of the first ever covert United Nations mm. operations, you know, it's rare that we have covert UN operations, this was one of them, uh, attempted to, to get at the camps that the LRA was seeking to establish. Guatemalan peacekeepers, a number of them were killed, at least eight of them were killed in this ambush. And I think the international community lost its appetite to deal with the LRA in Congo. Um, but throughout the time that the LRA were in peace talks, abuses continued. Now, not necessarily in Congo, though some were in Congo, but actually they went on consistent raids into southern Sudan and into the Central African Republic in order to abduct people to bring back to their base in Congo. And very little was said about that during the peace talks. And initially, when the information came out about the abuses being committed in Central African Republic, um, it was very uncomfortable for some of the international community members who were supporting the peace talks. And there was an attempt to repress those reports with the fear of upsetting the peace process. So I think that's just one other thing mm. to keep in mind. And lastly, I would say there's now indications, easy to say with hindsight, of course, but that actually during those two years when talks were going back and forth and back and forth, that members of the LRA were continuing to um, stockpile goods to stockpile food and other kinds of, of supplies, indicating they may never have been very serious about the peace talks to begin with. Thanks, Seneca. Peter, I mean, what in your view? Do you have any points, very clear points on, on, on the talks process itself that you think were fatally flawed or that well, outsiders have not? Yeah, I, I agree with Annika. Uh, I don't think the LRA was ever serious about the peace talks. I mean, think about and I think this issue of the ICC uh, was uh, kind of a straw man because, uh, you know, if the uh, LRA insisted on uh, being tried in Uganda, 
Kony himself has repeatedly said he's convinced that if he ever goes back to Uganda or turns himself over to Ugandan authorities, he'll be hanged. Well, certainly that won't happen at the ICC. They mm. don't execute people there. So his chances are better of survival, if that's his issue, are better with the ICC. Uh, secondly, uh, or thirdly, the issue of addressing the root causes of the war have, um, have never been addressed, and they still haven't been addressed. And I think the chances of that happening um, you know, are, are slim. So all the main issues that revolved around the peace talks uh, were never, never really going to be resolved by, um, you know, be resolved with this peace agreement. So uh, are, are you saying that should have been on the agenda and should have been taken more seriously parallel to the peace talks or that should be part of a peace deal that there has to be a separate process to look at the root yeah. causes of the war? Well, I think that ultimately, in the long run, has to be addressed, the root causes of the war. But I think, just going back to the LRA, I don't think they were ever serious about signing a peace deal. I agree with Annika. I mean, the violations that continued, the fact that uh, Kony seriously did not, or was, did not seriously uh, agree or would not agree to being tried in Uganda, uh, all these things. I just. I think it was just a ruse to buy themselves some time. So the, the issue of the roots causes wasn't a serious one either as far as you're concerned? Well, I mean, it's an issue, yeah, but yeah. I think in terms of the LRA, mm -hmm. I don't think it was any more serious than even the ICC. Uh, Joseph, mm -hmm. uh, what, what, in your view, led to the, 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 the failure of these talks? Or what? My, my, my view is that um, the, the entire process was fundamentally flawed yeah. and actually the point that we're actually saying that we shouldn't that perhaps they shouldn't have been focusing on is exactly what they should have been focusing on there is no way in which we could go ahead and find some kind of peace agreement in Congo between two powerful military forces without addressing the root causes um, the victims of LRA the victims of LRA are ordinary Ugandans the victims of Museveni and his army are ordinary Ugandans. Mm -hmm. Now, if the international community is interested in Uganda, they need, we need a comprehensive uh, a political approach inside Uganda. And I'm actually quite shocked that the Congolese president, um, the Sudanese president, I'm not really surprised about the US, you know, under Bush, that they could have, at the time when there was a semblance of peace over a two-year two -year period, when these guys were talking in Juba, instead of actually them putting pressure on Museveni, putting pressure on COIN, help dealing and engaging with Ugandan civil society and Ugandan political organizations, including ourselves, to try and look at the root causes and make sure that they carry this as a tiny little bit, regardless of what COIN and Museven have done. And for, for heaven's sake, the vast majority of Ugandans probably really don't care very much about COIN and Museveni, if you want mm -hmm. to present that way. But by and large, whether we like it or not, they're there. They're Ugandans. Both of them are armed. Museveni has attempted to fight these guys for the last 20 years and failed. And there is evidence in Uganda that while Museveni is doing that, he himself was committing massive uh, atrocities. So uh, it's an interesting point which has just been made by, uh, by Bernie that um, um, two weeks to the failure of the, um, the, the signing of the agreement, there was an operation. So quite clearly it meant that Museveni himself was preparing for war. So Museveni was preparing for war. And Coin naturally, was preparing for war. And I'm saying this um, against the background of being one of those few people who were fundamentally uh, frustrated, Patrick. I don't know whether we discussed this with you before. Um, I happen to have been one of those people who emanated my, my party uh, over a five, three year period, up to about four or five years ago, attempting to persuade the international community that it is actually possible to talk peace in Uganda. And I know some serious Western diplomats telling me in my face that, Joseph, you're being crazy. You can't talk to these guys. But I think we proved, them, we proved them wrong, that we brought these guys to a round table. But of course, they can come back and tell me that, why wasn't it resolved? But because it was not resolved, that is why, one of the reasons why I'm here. We, we are here. But I think it is still possible for us to, to deal with the, with, the, with the conflicts in northern Uganda. But I think the conflicts in northern Uganda will have to take a comprehensive look at the situation in Uganda and a comprehensive look in the situation in the region. Do, do you agree with Peter and Aneka's point that the LRA weren't really serious anyway uh, about getting to some agreement? That inevitably that it was going to be because it was a tactical issue they were trying I to think it was a tactical up. issue for, for both sides and uh, mm. I was just li reading some literature today and uh, the last night I was looking at uh, uh, um, uh, um, some literature a book from uh, Jan Engl England uh, mm. the, the, the the former UN humanitarian um, and uh, UN undersecretary who fast one who first brought this issue mm. 
this side of the world, meaning first amongst you guys from this side of the world, because we've been talking about it for the last 20 years, yeah. you know. And Jan England told, said that um, he met Museveni, he talked to Museveni, and Museveni told him, this is 2003, that look, you know, um, we'll have to sort out, this thing will have to be sorted out militarily. Even 2006, after these guys had already started talking, you know, England was actually, uh, Museveni met with England and told him that we'll have to resort to sort out this thing militarily. Now, was Museveni committed to it? No. Mm. So using neither side, really? Not, not, neither side. And I think maybe, yeah. with time, maybe a later stage, I really think that there wasn't sufficient time, considering that Cony had been in the bush for all this long, mm. considering that you guys in the, the Western side were actually saying that we don't know who these guys are, we don't know what they want. Quite rightly, I don't know the guy. I don't know what he wanted. But we, we never, you and I, we, we together, we never worked out what exactly they're fighting for. Do you think there was anything else in the sort of negotiating portfolio that they could have thrown at the LRN, they could have kept them or made them more serious? Possibly. Some sort of guarantees or po Possibly that, Patrick. But uh, I think the ICC issue is very interesting. I think probably Museveni asked Martin uh, um, coin over it by actually rushing to the ICC because and, and Mr. Ocampo may have to take responsibility here that if he was really an international lawyer who's actually genuinely interested in justice, mm -hmm. our evidence about the atrocities committed in Uganda leading to the formation of the ICC, and since the formation of ICC, by forces associated with the government, mm -hmm. as such that Museveni has got as much to answer for as probably coin. Really? Okay, well, that's going to be a big debating point, mm -hmm. I think, this evening. Um, um, can, can, I, can we go on from there? Yeah, and sure, immediately yeah. into the military situation, which uh, started up, uh, and this operation that uh, Museveni's son launched. Uh, can, can, you, uh, can, can, can you take us into that, uh, Anekra? Why it was launched, why it was launched, as you say, so, so quickly after the failure of the talks, the significance of that, what it achieved, and what it, what it failed to achieve. Mm. Uh, I think what absolutely what we've just heard is true that there was clearly a plan B being prepared for some time in advance of peace talks failing and I, I think uh, you know what was being said earlier by Barney is right that the United States in particular had lost patience with the peace talks quite early on and in part of course because this fit into very much Bush's view of evil doers, right? Good and evil. And Coney was clearly in, in the views of, of George Bush and many of those around him an evil doer. And this fit into the war on terror. And of course, during all this time, Coney had been added onto the terrorist list. And so this was very much at the time US policy. I think it will be interesting to see once we get onto what yeah. will happen now, because the policy is, of course, different under Obama. But it was clear that there were other preparations underway. Now, the sticking point for military operations by Uganda, of course, was always President Joseph Kabila. Because here was an army who had invaded Congo twice before, caused huge destruction for Congolese people. Was President Kabila going to agree to Ugandan army coming back in again? And of course, on December 14th, a military operation, a joint military operation was launched. But what's interesting is why does President Kabila change his mind? And there's a couple of reasons. One of the key ones is pressure by the United States, arm twisting. You know, the, Museveni had come to President Kabila repeatedly over the past two years, and specifically really since 2008, saying, let us go back in, let us go back in, we're going to deal with this. And President Kabila saying, no, 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 politically I cannot deal with this. Um, but pressure from the United States put significant weight on Joseph Kabila. There was a second component which made that much more palatable and much more politically viable for President Joseph Kabila. And that was a decision made by Joseph Kony in September of 2008. So this is important for us to understand why the military operations are launched. In September 2008, um, there had been a summer of a number of people, a number of LRA combatants coming out of the ranks um, of the LRA. So this was a program that had been launched by the United Nations to encourage defections. And there were about a dozen to 20 people mm. who came out during the summer of 2008, including some senior ranking LRA combatants, some, some officers, if we can call them that, some higher uh, ranking co commanders. And those defections worried deeply Joseph Kony and the LRA. And he made a decision 
that now it, it, those defections needed to be stopped. He needed to send a signal that this was not going to be allowed. And Congolese people were to be punished for assisting the defections. And in September of 2008, we saw the first significant wave of violence by the LRA against Congolese people. And this was a raid carried out over the course of three or four days, simultaneous attacks, where they deliberately went in and killed people and abducted young children. So the idea here was punish Congolese people and replenish the ranks. And they abducted about 200, mostly children. They specifically targeted schools, specifically targeted the younger classrooms in the schools. So ages uh, from 10 to 15 abducted nearly 200 children. That provided President Kabila with an additional trouble, an additional problem now. And so when the pressure came from the Americans, let's start a military operation, now he started to see that politically he might be able to sell this to the Congolese people. So on December 14th, an operation was launched jointly between the Ugandan army, the Sudanese army, and the Congolese army, largely Ugandan-led. Let's be clear, largely Ugandan-led, but of course the three countries signing up to it against the LRA. Is that the South Sudanese? The South Sudanese, Sudanese yeah. army. Yeah. South Sudanese mm -hmm. army. So this was a very tightly controlled, very few people knew about it. Uh, it happened, it was due to happen with a, a strike from airplanes, from in fact Uganda's MiG airplanes on December 14th, a surprise strike to be followed up very swiftly by ground troops. From the beginning, there were troubles. It started out with something we in the UK know lots about, bad weather. Um, and so the MiG fighters that were due to come overhead to bomb the camp, to do a surprise attack on the camp, uh, were unable to be used due to apparently a uh, low-lying low cloud. So instead they had to use the helicopters, which gives you less of a surprise attack because you can hear them coming. So the, the helicopters attacked, uh, and there were difficulties getting ground troops in quickly. So basically, everything that did go wrong, everything that could go wrong, did go wrong from the early days. They missed Joseph Kony, probably by about 10 to 15 minutes. It was pretty close, but they missed him and the senior leadership. And the ground troops did not come in quickly enough to contain the LRA, so they dispersed into multiple groups very quickly after the attack. And then, frankly, the operation was not prepared for what happened next. Surprisingly so, because the tactic used by the LRA is one they've used repeatedly over the past 20 years. Disperse into multiple small groups quickly, move quickly, and attack not those who are attacking you, but attack defenseless civilians. And they waited to launch attacks until Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, and then with devastating ferocity in town after town and village after village, they launched simultaneous attacks, which can only be described as killing raids. Their intention was not to leave anyone alive. And I went to the area soon after this happened, and I went to many of these villages and towns and saw exactly the devastation that the LRA were able to bring. And they, you know, the towns that they attacked, they didn't leave anyone alive. They killed men, women, children, babies, Whoever was there, they killed. In numerous towns, they wanted to maximize the death rate. So they would entice their victims to come. They would play the radio. They would force their victims to sing songs in order to try to pretend that there was a party going on so more people would come. Um, between December 24th and mid-January, over 800 people were killed in such raids. The killings continued uh, into February, and the death rate is now well over a thousand. Um, so now it's Congolese people paying the price. And the abductions have also continued. Initially, the raids were very much killing raids. Later on, we're starting to see them abduct. The numbers are now 400, 500. So they are replenishing the ranks. The LRA are now dispersed into uh, a variety of different locations. And I think the military operation had them on the run. But it didn't apprehend the senior leadership. And it's not clear how much of a blow was given to the military machine. Clearly, there was some blow. Undoubtedly, that was the case. They were pushed out of their bases. They're on the run. They're you know, having to move quickly, which is hard to do with significant ammunition and supplies. Um, but now that the military operation has, in effect, ended, the Ugandans were asked to leave. 
President Kabila had initially given the Ugandans four weeks. Then the, U the Ugandans kept saying, give us another week, give us another week, give us another week. And after two and a half months, politically it became unpalatable for President Kabila to allow this to continue. And he asked the Ugandan army to leave uh, and said that the Congolese army would now continue the operations. Anyone here who deals with Congo will know that that's a bit of a joke, to say the least. Um, so the military pressure is now off. We continue to receive reports of continued killings, but less than what we saw over the Christmas period. But the devastation in northern Congo is immense. Over 150,000 people displaced in northern Congo, some in southern Sudan as well, because the attacks were also across the border, although the majority of the killings were in northern Congo. And, you know, this is a population that is actually relatively spread out. So the effects of displacement are significant for their survival. And people are terrified. To be honest, they're terrified. And they're desperate to see an end to the LRA, are desperate to see that Kony is arrested and dealt with. But their hopes are now quickly fading with the end of a military operation and not yet clear what happens next because you know, is the Congolese army going to do this? Unlikely. They, I don't think they've won a single battle in the last five or six years, perhaps throughout their mm, history. Longer than that. Eh? Perhaps yeah. longer than that. And the United Nations at the moment still has less than 300 troops in an area that is something like 50 or 60,000 square kilometers. The reality is that the people of northern Congo are now at the mercy of the LRA, and it's not clear what happens next and who will protect them. Thanks, Anika. Uh, Barney, uh, what does this tell us about <coughs> this war has been going on essentially for two decades now? Yes. Uh, and Museveni once ran one of what was regarded in the 80s as one of the best guerrilla armies in Africa. Um, two decades later, we're still having, we're seeing these scenes. As Anika has pointed out, this, this operation failed. What does this tell us about the, the attempts to find a military solution? Is it just absolutely pointless, or do you think? if you'd had a sort of, I don't know, is Rwandan-style uh, precision, mm -hmm. uh, to quote another army that's been extremely effective about dealing with its opponents, do you think they could have done it? Is, it? is there something basically flawed with the military approach, or is it just a matter of military technique, do you think? Uh, the, the reality is that guerrillas are very difficult to smoke out. And if you get to the terrain we're talking about, you see from the air, it is basically broccoli. There's nothing there. You can sink three divisions, and it will be absorbed without a problem. So it is very difficult to defeat the LRA. It's possible for a small group, a small band of people to, to create a lot of havoc over a very, very wide area. And, 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 and listening to the description of Congo, this is northern Uganda. This is a Choli for the last 20 years, where at the height of the insurgency, two million people were displaced and having to live in camps and, and, and fear attacks. So, so when you hear military people you know, confidently proclaiming that you know, it will all be over, we missed him by 15 minutes, this is the third time mm -hmm. that he's been missed by a whisker. Yeah. And so, so it is. It is. It is. Uh, it is difficult to, to share the, 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 the optimism that uh, there is a quick military fix to this. And this is precisely what what what, what drove Southern Sudanese to talk to the LRA. These mm -hmm. these people had fought the LRA, so yeah. they knew the LRA yeah. in the battlefield. It's very easy for us to come in a little bit later uh, with with without the military experience. And, and, and say, oh no, there is, there's only one way of, of, of doing this. There isn't only one way. And, and one has to, to, to do both. You have to protect civilians. You have to do that effectively. If you're going to plan anything military, you have to make sure that, that civilians are not, as far as possible, put in harm's way. But, the, but to say that there is a, a big bombing that's going to destroy the LRA in one sortie is, uh, is, is a little bit faster. So the other side to the equation is if you go in and you, you've got an idea to capture Kohn and the uh, top LRA leadership, and you, you should have it in the back of your mind, if you get that wrong, then hundreds of innocents are going to die as a result yeah. of your incompetence. Well, you should have more than one military plan. You should say if, we, if the first wave, if the MiGs don't do the job mm -hmm. and, and nobody 
and the air, air strikes are, are, are very, very imprecise. Uh, what do we do? What yeah. is he going to do next? Yeah. And I think the criticism was that nobody seemed to have anticipated mm. yeah. that, that that civilians would, uh, would 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 come into in, into risk because of that. And that 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 for me is is, is the weakness that's, there. That's, and that's what's happened so many times before. Yeah, mm. yeah, because there's precedent for that. Um, Peter, uh, what's your view of that failed military operation? Do, do, do you think it was fundamentally flawed? The tactics are wrong, or do, do you think it was a, it, it could have worked? I mean, if if, if they taken cognizance of the fact that civilians should needed to be protected and they'd had the right gear, they'd had the right planes, the weather was better, and all those ifs. If they'd been put into place, could it have worked, do you think? Well, I think you, uh, <laughs> just by the, the question you ask, that there's so many ifs yeah. there. And I think uh, we see now in retrospect that, you know, so many of these ifs did not occur. Um, you know, my biggest uh, disappointment with the whole thing is the, is the aftermath, is that the way the LRA reacted. Um, and they're striking the, 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 the most soft of the soft targets. And I think it only underscores to my mind, you know, that this is a group of very bad characters we're dealing with here. And they have to be dealt with in a very severe fashion. And I think that, uh, you know, the international community has come around to that point of view. But like Bonnie was saying, this is a very, very difficult group. You know, we had a golden moment there where they're generally amassed together in one place. And now they're dispersed, and it's virtually impossible. Uh, as we all know, you know, guerrilla warfare is uh, extremely difficult. And as the United States knows from Vietnam, yeah. it goes on forever. You know, you, you hit one group, one small group, and it's, it's kind of an endless process. Yeah. So I think we just, you know, one golden chance was blown. And now what are we left yeah. with? I mean, we're going to talk about that yeah. more. Thanks. Uh, Joseph, what, what's your take? Uh, on, on the prospects of a military solution and the history indeed. You know, uh, you're asking the wrong guy because yeah. I actually don't do military. Yeah. I, um, I, I left Uganda in 1987 running uh, from Makere University as a student into mm -hmm. exile in this country and thank you very much for your exile. I, <laughs> I just <laughs> about returned in the, no, in, um, I returned for the first time in 2005 and all along my party and the younger members of my generation resolved that we did not like to change governments by force, even the guys who had forced it out. Mm. So continuously, my party, my, my leadership, including the oldest guys, the grandparents of the party, were arguing all along, and we're arguing today that the only way, and Uganda is our country, you know, the only way we will resolve our conflicts as Ugandans are to deal put all Ugandans together. Because as I said, you know, as you suggest, yeah, some of these guys are very bad guys. But you know, there are many, many bad guys in Uganda amongst the coin people, without the coin people. And there's some very terrible guys around the world, you know, including some of the guys who helped, who helped to create the situation in which we ended up in. I now maybe talk about some of these things, the context. I might be talking about the context of, sorry, I might be talking about the context of some of these things yeah. much later, you know. Sure. Um, we had child soldiers before. Yep. We had child soldiers in, in Luero. We seven used them. Um, we had child soldiers in northern Uganda. This war started in March 1986. Museveni did not have to have started this war in northern Uganda because he had actually had an easy ride, an easy override into northern Uganda. You know, the fact that he started with young men of fighting age, and Patrick, you know, you've done quite some, some we looked at some of the things, you know, chasing young men of fighting age, mm. disappearing and binding them into lorries. I have some very horrific ho photographs. Initially, I was thinking of bringing them here, the photographs taken in 1987, and I thought maybe they're not the right, the, the right place to bring them. You know, those are victims of the one side of the conflict. And for us, we're saying, look, whatever the case, we need to put a closure. And for me, who has never lived as a natural adult in Uganda? I want to have an opportunity to be able to live as a natural adult in Uganda. I want to have an opportunity to engage Museveni across the board and argue with him. And some of you guys call him an intellectual. <laughs> you know, I want to argue with him on issues, sure. you know, so that we resolve our conflicts, begin to rebuild our country. I take strong exceptions to the situation in which Congo, as you rightly suggest, five million people in Congo. You know, what were the root causes? And who are the guys who led it to these guys? These are the guys who led us. So I'm saying I don't believe that the military solution ever helped us in Rwanda, it did not. It could not help us in, Ru in Burundi. It has not helped us in, in Congo. The Congolese are just about fighting it. The Sudanese, I think, Bani, you're quite right. 
that the SPLA guys who had actually fought these guys on behalf of Museveni, I think credit to them, they actually thought that, one, these are our neighbors, mm. but two, we know these things are not going to end like this. As Africans, and I've spoken to some of these guys, meaning from the guys from Southern Sudan, that as Africans, we need to begin to have a, a new beginning. Some of us were looked at and laughed at, meaning the SPLA guys, over several years that, you know, we're Bush guys in Southern Sudan. We want to show that Africans can also lead normal lives as but normal people. You're saying there's no military solution. You're saying that Ugandan military has a role. The Ugandan military... It has a duty Patrick, to protect civilians. Ugandan Uganda, military actually, indeed, but Ugandan military failed. Yeah. Other than the four peace talks, yeah. there was an army commander called James Kazini who went and camped in northern Uganda in the early 90s, shortly before Betty Bigombe came and think, you know? And he declared publicly, you know, that he would resign if he did not defeat, defeat Coyne. By then, mm. Coyne was inside Uganda, my country, you know? Mm. He did not defeat them. Mm. He didn't resign. Yeah. The only thing I had about Coyne was some major news headlines he's supposed to be court-martialed. Mm. And this is a guy who took billions mm. of Uganda shillings, several hundred <laughs> hundred thousands of, of, of British pounds, which I pay this way in, 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 in my taxes, and on the other hand, in the name of Uganda people. Oh. It did not. Museveni went and camped in northern Uganda in the 90s. And it's very, very frustrating. He camped in there and he said he would not leave Gulu until he defeats Coin. And you guys, we are talking about one side here. We don't have the true stories of why these guys were camped in northern Uganda, mm -hmm. what was actually happening, what was actually happening to... to they are concealing genocide. That's okay. not acceptable. Okay. Okay. Let me just uh, we'll yeah. get on to all that because yeah. it's important stuff. Yeah. Mm. What was uh, you know? Concealment of genocide. Yeah. So you know what was really going mm. the other side of it. So it militarily it failed. Now in 1996, when there was some semblance of multi party, yeah. semblance of elections mm. after a new constitution was written, Coyne actually said that if the, Democrat, the, the, the then presidential candidate who stood against Museveni on a no-party ticket, which right. we in the West were backing, by the way, 1996, <laughs> we're backing a no-party system, one-party system in Uganda, you know? Mm. Coin actually said that if Museveni lost, they would come out of the bush. Right. So I am still fundamentally convinced, because I said I don't know yeah. Coin, you know, mm -hmm. I'm still fundamentally convinced that these are Ugandans with whom we can sit as Ugandans round table and have a way in which yeah. to resolve. Now, if, if we fail all this time, militarily, yeah. What is the way? You know, we went to Iraq. It mm. failed. <laughs> We're finding a strategy mm. back. We went to Afghanistan. Mm. You know, we hope it is resolved somewhere, somehow. We, as Ugandans, we fought for 22 years, you know, and it hasn't worked. For heaven's sake, some of us are saying that we believe in the ballot. <laughs> let's, sort it, let's sort it out a round table through the ballot. Okay. You know, we've had peace and reconciliation commissions mm. in Southern Africa. What about in Uganda? Okay. Uh, Aneka, you wanted to come Yeah, well, I, I think there's something we need to also put into this debate, because mm. it was clear that the peace talks didn't work. Mm -hmm. So if the LRA are not serious, and we're talking about, what, a group of 600 guys yeah, initially, sure. right? I mean, this was th this is different from many of the other armed groups, I think, that we see in Africa, and certainly in this region of Africa. You had 600 who abduct children constantly, who rule by violence and terror through, generally speaking, one individual who's at mm. the head. Um, if peace talks are not the option, I think one has to put the military option on the table. Now, I think the c critical question mm. here was, was the Ugandan army the right one to go after the LRA? <laughs> no, of course not. We've had 20 years of this. Where was the international community, right? Where are those countries who support the ICC, who want to see apprehension of individuals wanted by the court? Where was the support if the United States was, was keen on this? Where were the special forces? You know, this was a golden opportunity. They were together. Kony was running a farm in northern Congo. You know, the, the 40 acres of maize and potatoes and beans. The, this, I, I think one can't put the military option off the table. I think one has to ask serious questions. Can one talk to Kony? Is he part of the, the answer to peace in northern Uganda? Most northern Ugandans have also very little connection now with Joseph Kony. He doesn't represent necessarily... And, and I think issues. that's an opportunity which was lost, because yeah. I think from mm. 2006, um, that was a lost opportunity for the mm. two years, and, and maybe we need to go into it mm. much later, that there was need to, for confidence to be built mm. amongst the communities in northern Uganda. They needed to have been engaged. Mm. We needed to have a national te political dialogue of some sort, all of us taking the conflicts in northern Uganda as a political issue by mm. established political parties. You know, in this country when we were fighting in Northern Ireland, the Conservatives had a view, the Labour Party had a view. How do we deal with it? It is about talks or no talks. Mm. You know, um, so in Uganda, this should be a political issue in which coin comes with agenda. Museveni 
Remember, Museveni is a, part, a partisan belligerent in this, you know? And the only thing I need to say here is that the coin guys, beyond everything else that is actually reported about them, sometimes there's an element of frustration that, you know, um, it is, to be fair, they don't do probably that very well in articulating some of the issues, particularly related, uh, related bringing up issues from, from the other side of it. But as I said, yeah. as far as I'm concerned, um, the only way in which we're going to resolve the conflicts in Uganda is, 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 uh, is, is, is politics. Because if we got rid of coin, which we can't, and for me, I'm quite happy for us to get rid of him. I'm just not quite sure if we don't address the underlying issues that some other coins may not emerge. OK. No, that's f um, Peter, c can we get on to the next bit, really, of the discussion, which is the status of the LRA at the moment? Maybe even you, you've spent a lot of time in the region studying and interviewing th th this outfit. And, and could you tell us where they are now? And really, the, the core question we're, we're trying to work out this evening, it, it, you know, what, what, what are the, what is the future for the organization, but more importantly, the people that are suffering under this organization? Yeah, I'm, uh, after following it and uh, writing about it uh, uh, and, and researching, I, I was able to visit uh, the town of Dungu, which is in northern uh, uh, DRC, last June, and I interviewed a lot of people there as well. And it, even back then, uh, people were terrified that Kony had just completed his first wave of attacks and gone on to this extended raid up to uh, uh, the Central African Republic and then come back and that's where he grabbed his first group of uh, abductees um, but I my sense is that over the years uh, I would say certainly for the last five or six years that he was fighting in northern Uganda I think this organization has become a self-sustaining militia mm -hmm. they have separated themselves over such a period of time they've done so much they've done so much destruction in northern Uganda that uh, the, there was no longer the kind of political uh, you know, support among the people that had been there initially. And I think their whole political agenda had dissipated. And I think they had, a, when they migrated from northern Uganda to the DRC in the you know, fall of 2005, and the, the remaining units went over there in early 2006, um, I think they've become a self-sustaining organization at this point. And I, and I, I fear that uh, the fact that they've been able to survive and survive this recent attack has uh, bolstered Kony's uh, concept of who the LRA is and what it can be. And I think they continue to receive some kind of support as they have for a long time from the Khartoum government. So given the situation of relative isolation, that they seem to be relatively untouchable, I think they're in a position now to um, wreak some havoc uh, on a larger scale than what they have done in, uh, in the recent past. Um, this is you know, pure speculation, but uh, looking at some of the regional dynamics, um, we have a, an election coming up uh, in 2011 in South Sudan, and I think the Khartoum government is holding this organization in some kind of reserve, uh, like a you know, like a trump card that they can use at some point to influence whatever is going to be the eventual uh, situation that's going to evolve in South Sudan, which very likely could be war. And if they can use Kony as another instrument to cause trouble there, I mean, I think that's a distinct possibility. If not there, uh, they could certainly migrate even further north and become a factor uh, in Darfur. And uh, I mean, that's far-fetched. I'm, mm. I'm saying this is pure speculation. But regardless, you know, the bottom line is that the existence of this organization uh, and continued existence does not bode well in any way, shape, or form for so, anybody. So you're saying essentially that they're stronger than ever? I think that psychologically, Kony is, is, is going to emerge from this uh, feeling feeling very strong and basically invulnerable. And, and you you go along with the reports recently that they're being resupplied by Khartoum uh, for the use as a sort of pro Khartoum militia in southern Sudan and yeah for whatever general. whatever purpose. Mm -hmm. I mean that that possibility is very distinct. I, that he's getting some support yeah. from somewhere, and, and I know it's hard to, to nail down unless we have some spooks in the audience that can verify this for us. But yeah. <laughs> Any spooks in the audience? <laughs> <laughs> we must recruit you as a correspondent. <laughs> oh, 
Do, do you want to comment specifically on the resupply issue? I mean, if, if uh, yeah, I wanted to, 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 so, sorry, comment, to comment a little bit. Because J just on the resupply, then we'll get into a more general discussion. Uh, yeah, yeah, because uh, I'm one of the delegates of Cody. Okay. Oh. I've been in Juba, and I, I, I Paco knows me very well. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure I know. Next thing I say, we are not serious because we have got a lot of uh, support and we had a lot of issues to be discussed. What I'm hearing is completely different from what was in Juba and what people were doing. <clears throat> Apparently, just to cut the certain story short, I've also been to Uganda and to the north. And there are actually people, uh, and actually anyway, there are actually people who knows who is killing them, which commander was there, on which date. They know that it is the NRA or the UPDA who are dressing up like coin, and they would come. And Otema Wen was one of them. They were calling themselves the destructive forces. When we were in Juba, we put our conditions very clearly until it was sabotaged from Mombasa. OK, this is all okay. very interesting. Anyway. But can, can you just answer the question, that, who, who are you getting your supplies from? I'm not in the bush. <laughs> Do you never talk to them on your cell? Uh, when they talk to me, they say they get the supply from the NRA, whom they from have the killed. From the NRA? Whom they have killed. Right. Oh, yeah. never, never from Khartoum? No, I okay. don't know that. Uh, what, and, and the, the NRA are good enough to, uh, <laughs> to drop uh, these supplies by air to the market? Pardon? Are the NRA dropping supplies by air to no, the No, they killed. They killed, kill. okay. Yeah. okay. The, the one they killed in the battleground. Okay. Well, so, look, I, what you, I'm saying is that it would be that I've got some, uh, some information here. Okay. Which I would, uh, I would hope people would be better willing to see. How they start, the peace talk started. The, the heading is that... Uh, that the, why, why don't we the foundation was built on sand. Mm. First of all, Sudan was not a reliable place to speak in. Okay. It was completely incapable. Secondly, we have got our points we, we put down in front of the peace team, and Afaka was here. And we were very serious. Mm. Because when we are called to talk, we talk. Now. The killing which has been happening happens very close to the military barracks of the UPDF, which is Museveni's groups. And we are wondering if Kony is under pressure, you would go to kill very close to the barracks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I, I'll come back. Yeah, later. sure. We, we, you've got obviously got a lot of expertise in this area. Yeah. We want to tap it. Um, Barney, can, can I um, get your impressions? Um, you know, Peter's assessment of the LRA, stronger than ever, um, more significant and bolstered, in fact, by the, by the failure of this latest military operation. What, what do you think is the future for the group now? What, 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 are, what are his plans? To be used again by Khartoum in the uh, elections in southern Sudan? What, what, what is in store? Because of its previous well-documented connections with Khartoum, <coughs> The LRA has always been regarded with suspicion, and in, in, indeed some of the motivation for, 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 for some groups to promote the talks is to sever yeah. that link completely. Um, I have no information on, on, uh, on, on <coughs> whether links have resumed or not, but I, I, I believe that it is unhelpful to have such a group under arms and, and not back in the fold, and, yeah. and that's why I, I think it's important to try to get the LRA back in the fold. The, the, and of course, terrible things have happened. But I, I, I find it uh, entirely unproductive to, to, to merely characterize the LRA as, 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 as an evil, devious group that you can't trust, that, that takes you absolutely nowhere. Mm. Difficult as it is, you have to find a way of engaging with people who are under arms, because the safety of a lot of people, the progress of entire regions, depends on it. And right. I think what is happening increasingly in the world is that we are narrowing our options and, and waving the justice card. And that right. if somebody does this, we do not touch them. They're pariahs. Uh, they're only there to be arrested and charged and prosecuted. Th th those, those are important values to have in the world. But we need to look beneath that and say, what really is, 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 is happening? How are they impacting on, on 
hundreds of thousands of people, and what can we do about that situation? Uh, so I fear that we've been we've bought into the this whole ideology of uh, of retribution and justice first, and and it's not been very productive in terms of conflict resolution. Not only with the LRA situation, but increasingly that will be seen in other you know, in other situations. So and you, and you see, there's nobody in the region really a, able or willing to take them on. I think it's 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 not. I, I don't agree that 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 um, uh, that, that uh, people choose not to engage with, with the LRA when they could. I think that if they thought it could be done easily, mm. I think they would give it a go. Mm. I think military people want a success. I think they would want to notch that up. But but and, and I've spoken to a lot of military people, senior military people around the world on this matter. They they, they have reservations. They, they they don't feel comfortable without a really clear plan and an exit strategy going in after after a group, even like the LRA. So so yes, you might want to be rid of them, but it's not easy. And and it's going to take time, but and, and you can't close off options like Definitely. dialogue. Thanks. Um uh, Aneka, wh wh where do you think Nick? group stands right now? Stronger than ever? or? Uh, well, let me first I, I just want to say something about this, this peace versus justice debate, because I just, I just don't buy that. I think we rarely see sustainable peace without justice. I completely agree that the timing is important, and that one has to think about when something comes after the other. But I think this debate that we're starting to see, we see it in Sudan at the moment, you know, arrest President Bashir and peace in Darfur is going to fall apart. There isn't a peace in Darfur. So I, I think that justice is vitally important for sustainable peace. And that the trick is, how do we make that work? And, and I don't think the two are exclusive. I certainly don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think the difficulty now with the LRA is that neither option has worked. And it does leave us with a very difficult situation. The peace process didn't work. Kony didn't turn up on, on endless occasions to sign the peace agreement, despite having held, had some uh, movement on the issue of, of ICC and of justice. So of having this agreement, which, which you described very well, where they, in fact, had now come up with a solution of possibly having trials inside Uganda, although the International Criminal Court would have had to agree with that. Um, and the military option hasn't worked. And what it is left is Kony is still there, the leadership is still there, uh, the people of Eastern Congo are, or Northern Congo are still at risk. What do we do now? Are, they, are we going to allow them to regroup? Are we going to allow them to rearm, to become a menace for the entire region at a time when it's very sensitive for Southern Sudan, um, when we've already seen the implications also for the two Kivu provinces in Eastern Congo, where because the Ugandan army was allowed back in, it opened the door for the Rwandan army to come back in in the two Kivu provinces. It's not our discussion for today, but the implications are important. So will they come back stronger than ever? I think it's a possibility. I think they are weaker today. I'm sure that, that Kony himself is feeling a bit triumphant at the moment because you know, the military operation in theory has ended. But uh, they, they are dispersed. I think they are much weaker. It might provide some new opportunities, but I think a dispersed LRA wanting to abduct and to replenish the ranks is a dangerous group. And, uh, you know, I, I think we're in a very difficult situation, and I don't have the answers to what happens next on this, right. but both options seem to have failed. Uh, um, Joseph, yeah. uh, just give me quickly your, your, your assessment of, of where the LRA is, and before you go into the, uh, your, your bigger mm -hmm. discussion of, of uh, how this fits into the political landscape in, in, in Uganda, and, and you know, what, uh, as we run into the next set of elections with Museveni standing again? I, I think in context, as, we, as, as has already been presented, um, um, we, we don't have, and, and some of my colleagues, in, in, in political colleagues in Uganda have uh, been having conversations about this. Uh, uh, I know that there was uh, some uh, uh, controversies uh, uh, the, just the other week about the cost of yeah. the Congo oppression, where there were headlines about uh, um, 390 million Uganda shillings, and that's uh, just under 330,000. Pounds, which of course, you know, the side of the world may not be much, but uh, that saves quite a few people as the cost of operations in Congo. Um, but linked to that was whether or not the operation was necessarily worth it, and if it was, you know, was it you know, what, what, where, where does it leave coin? 
we, we don't know. And I think, as initially presented, it would appear that um, you know it was a botched up operation. I think, as uh, as your, your your literature suggests, meaning that uh, um, coin is probably today not any different from the coin who was there in a way back in, in November last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and as I said, politically, and I feel fairly strong about this, we probably, you know, the confidence that we attempted to build over a two-year period um, was actually destroyed by that operation. And I just don't accept the idea that um, um, that uh, we've tried both options and, and, and concluded them. I don't believe that the peaceful option uh, has, has been uh, concluded. As I said, two years was not long enough. Um, there was not yet a time when Museveni um, spoke to coin. There was not at a time when Museveni, to my understanding, <laughs> Museveni met with coin. Um, in fact, there was a time last year when uh, Museveni actually said in, in a public interview, you know, the guy is rather arrogant. Uh, I mean, if you're back by America, you would be. Um, the guy said that, um, you know, that um, I, did not, I did not send anybody to go and talk to coin, meaning making reference to his internal affairs minister. Mm -hmm. Now, if you speak like that, you know, what really, what message are you passing on to the other side? Now, if ICC is hanging on the other side, which is a real issue, Museveni is, represents the government. Um, most of the regional governments are really bound large on his side. You could argue that the chief mediator, um, um, Joachim Chisano, the former president of Mozambique, he quite clearly on the side, which is part of the reason that the thing is that, that this guy has raised, that the coin, there was not enough time to give, this, give confidence to coin his side to come onto the table. Now, again, as it was being said earlier, we are not saying that by so saying <laughs> you're necessarily justifying what they're doing. We're simply saying that, well, 20 years did not work. If we are to have two years, two more years from 2008 to build confidence, for Museven to begin talking to these guys. And it's, it's interesting, you, you get, you're, you're down there as I understand, a student. You know, the guys who had never talked to one another, they found themselves sitting down, talking together, hugging one another as, as citizens and friends. You know, that's how, you, how, that's how you build the confidence. I'm not an expert in this, but I am an expert on humanitarian issues. And, um, and I link that with my political values, and I find it that, no, I think we needed to, to give these guys more time. But of course, the, your question is, are they stronger? Inside Uganda, I don't know. All of us want peace. And I think our message to Coin and our message to Museveni and our message to those people who are backing both sides, I'm talking politically, is that use your influences to encourage both sides to come back to the round table so that we begin from wherever it stopped, you know, and forge a way forward, ensure that no child is killed in northern Uganda, whether it's by Coin or Museveni. No child is abducted in Congo, whether it's by Rwandese or coin or Museveni or Congolese forces. We are simply saying, <laughs> let's have a new, given opportunity for which we're able to have a fresh start. Do you, do you think there's an absolute equivalence between the LRA and the UPDF that really, as far as you're concerned, the UPDF has killed at least as many people as the LRA, if not more. Um, the, neither of them can be if, trusted. If, if, you, if, you want, if you want me to be very frank with you, yeah. I would actually, if you take the L UPDF, which you call NRA, which is the Uganda government forces, with the way they started from Luweru, mm -hmm. with their figures, with their facts and figures and their moralities, I would say yes. But I mean, I think well, putting as, of, as of I think today, you think there's an absolute think, equivalence. But I'm not really quite sure whether the comparisons. But is I mean, so so essentially, the ICC should issue oh, no, a warrant no. for the arrest of Muslims. I have no doubt about it. I have no doubt yeah. about it. And if there's anybody with a message from the seventy, they should do so. Mm -hmm. But um, is it useful at the moment? I'm simply saying, let's try to create a situation in which all military forces in Uganda in and outside Uganda, who are you can with Ugandan interest, mm -hmm. are brought back a table so that we talk politics, because I believe politics is the way forward for, for our country. Oh, oh, okay. Um, I, I think it's probably, sh if, you know, by all means, if we can speak more about the you know, politics yeah. of Uganda, but perhaps we should, a number of people, uh, if lady there with the glasses, we try to get a question for a long time. If, if we could get you to speak, could you please uh, tell us, uh, you know, what all your uh, affiliation is, what organisation you're from, or whether you're a concerned citizen or oh, okay. whatever? Yeah. No, my name is Josephine Apia. I was a deputy delegation leader to give up this talk for the LRA. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I could have spoken <laughs> for five hours. Okay. But uh, first of all, I was not. No, no, <laughs> no, no that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It, to talk about the Juba peace yeah. failed. I mean, the failed Juba peace talk uh, need about five hours. But I'm going to put it very briefly. Very, bullet, very briefly. Bullet points. Yeah, yeah. yeah in I'm the metaphorical and, sense. I'm trying to handle bullet. the bullet points. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the peace process, there was no peace process as far as the LR is concerned. 
The LRS started their peace process a long time ago to be allowed to select their own people to sit and represent them. That has not been allowed up to today. About three of us went to Juba, but we were kicked out. We did, we did no time. The problem which I see with the peace talk is what I'm hearing here in the table here. What Aneka was saying, she sounded almost, is it Aneka or Aneka? Aneka. Aneka. You sound more like a military uh, person than a human rights person. <laughs> because we are talking real military. And this is where the problem comes from. And another problem with Peter, you're saying, we have got golden chance to deal a blow. You went there to kill people. So all you wanted was LRA to collect in one place. You bombed them and killed these people. And you started bombing people right from northern Uganda. You started killing people right from Luero. Today is the time to tell the truth. And all of us must start telling the truth so that peace can come in the world. What you are talking about is proxy war in Africa so that you kill the population, take away their land, take their gold, take their every resource from there. That is the problem we are talking about. And that is why the peace talk did not take place. And I will tell you that while we went there with good intention, and Kony is a man who wants to talk to everybody, including all of you, and I've talked to him, he's not the monster that you are painting. He started fighting because, like me, my mother was burned alive by Museveni's troop when they came to northern Uganda. And Kony was still a little boy, he was not in the bush. This is what we need to be addressing. So when we went to Juba, nobody, Kony was not allowed to select his delegation. Instead, International organizations like Pax Christi, like Senegidio, they sponsor their own group who are government of Uganda intelligent to be delegation for the LRA. So how were they going to talk on behalf of the LRA? So Konya is aware of that. No three quarters of the delegation, the so-called LRA delegation, we are government agents who were pretending to be speaking on behalf of the delegation. For some of us who went willingly to go and solve the problem, we were kicked out, we were isolated. Uh, uh, you know about that. Eh? Uh, you, you, you are a legal person, you know about that. And there were so many of you legal people for the government of Uganda. And we had two legal people for the LRA. And they were kicked out. They were not a paid allowance. They were denied so many things. They had to go back. So this is where the problem Nothing was discussed. Although we managed to get an agenda, there were five agendas. Out of the five agendas, we only discussed Cessation of hostility, which Kony is respecting until today. And with seven, well, no, because I get heated up. Because it's been too much lying. People have been lying too much. Can, can, you, can you tell us now, we've I mean, got you here, yeah. uh, about the, the LRA itself. It's been characterized this evening as, as a self-sustaining militia. Does the LRA have a political agenda? What, what is it beyond seeing you know, yeah. the end of Museveni's yeah. government? Well, the LRA has political agenda. First of all, to stop the human rights abuse by Museveni, okay. and then to bring uh, proper democracy in Uganda, because Museveni is a military dictator who is ruling Uganda by the fist. What, and to bring change. What, what's wrong with you going to Uganda now and campaigning <laughs> as a member of a party to support those objectives? There's no political party supporting there. There are no real opposition to Museveni, because he's a military dictator. There's no opposition in Uganda. So you, you, you have, have a political agenda, member. but until Museveni gives up power, you, you're not prepared to operate as a civilian. Well, until party. the whole political setup, which was set up by this proxy war, until it's all been changed, so that there is proper democracy in Uganda. That is the problem with, uh, with uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. That the next one, which I was going to talk about, well, but the agenda was there. We discussed only agenda number one, which is decision of stability. Yeah. And Kony is respecting that until today. But from day one, Museveni has been following Kony everywhere and attacking Kony all the way. Except that he's been defeated, even the last the so-called Operation Lightning. Mm. Yeah? How yeah. can well, they lost it? Are they a you, you've explained, they, you, sorry, you've explained very well what yeah. the, your, your gripe with, with yeah. Museveni is yeah. in northern Uganda. Yeah. I think a lot of people here would know that. Yeah. But as far as I understand, the LRA has killed almost as many people in southern Sudan as it has in northern Uganda. It's now killed over a thousand people in Congo. What is their problem with the people of Congo and the people of southern Sudan? Well, why, is the, why is the LRA military correct. engaging in, in those areas? Correct, correct. I'll ask Aneka, you, you are very good to know that there are only 600 LRA. How can they go about killing 600 people? And yet you've got the government of Sudan, the government of Uganda, the UN, you've got the aircraft above, and you've got the commandos on the ground. And you follow them so that you count it every one by one. So how don't you get to stop them from killing 900 people? What happened? Why, do, why are you not there to stop them? Let's just go and answer that. 
I would like well, to answer that. Yeah, why, why, because, why don't you stop there? Because, actually, well, first of all, I'm not the UN, but I, I think it's worth answering because I, I hear this one a lot, that the LRA claims it wasn't them who carried out the killings in northern Congo, that it was perhaps UPDF dressed up as LRA again. I have to say we looked into this in a huge amount of detail because Human Rights Watch has also documented abuses by the UPDF in northern Uganda and we have always continued to say that justice needs to be done on both sides. For these killings in Congo, there was no evidence whatsoever that it was being done other than by the LRA. We talked to numerous children who had been abducted by the LRA during these, these killing raids. It is absolutely clear where they were taken. They were taken to LRA bases. These are the ones who managed to escape. It is absolutely clear from the local community who had seen LRA pass previously that these were the same people. All indications were that these were Lord's Resistance Army uh, combatants who were carrying out the killing. So I think the question goes back to you. Why is the LRA and why is Joseph Kony targeting Congolese civilians? Why would God want to target Congolese? There's only seven who wants to live there, isn't it? This killing happened only when the troops of the UPDF went to Congo. And last time they went and killed people for That's about no three excuse. years. It still makes it did a war not say time. anything about it. It still makes it so a war I, I, you're, Are you attacks. saying point blank then, then that the Congolese civilians who were killed after the failed UPDF attack on the LRA base, you're saying all those Congolese were killed by Ugandan soldiers, yes, not by the Yes, because they LRA. want the Congolese people to, act, to react against the LRA. And that's what they've done all along the way. There's no evidence. No, what, what evidence do you want? What well, more evidence do you want? <laughs> you are there, you've got you, all yes, the machinery I, around you. The LRA does not have a machinery it, it, to, to, to lay, to lay their, their story to the world. I mean, broader than that, the, as far as you're concerned, the, the LRA is absolutely innocent of any of the no, accusations no, the LRA, of humor. Well, of course, in, across, in, during front line, people get killed. Maybe no, no, by I'm, accident. I'm talking about but the they, deliberate. They do not, they I'm talking do not, about the deliberate targeting no, of no, civilian no, the abducting no, of children. How would they last 20 years if they were doing that? Well, one could argue that that's uh, supplemented what? their ranks. What? But it's more do they, do they, they not will not be here 20 years mm. if they were killing people. Why would they kill people? Mm. The people who are supporting them, people who know why they're okay. fighting. Huh? Unless okay. we well, address the reason why the war started, yeah. which I don't hear anybody talking about it here. Well, then the peace will come. We, to we're going to get to that. Region. We're going to get to that. Um, because let, let's, if we can get, uh, well, m maybe I could speak to a fellow journalist just uh, at, the, at the back of the, the room. Mike, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, um, Mike Aldridge with BBC. Does the panel feel that the general demonizing of, uh, jo of Joseph Conyu by, I'll say the media and also by many humanitarian organizations, however justified it might be, help or hinder uh, the search for peace? And also, do you think that there are spiritual forces at play in the region that can be drawn upon by the LRA by virtue of its being called the Lord's Resistance Army? Thank you, Mike. Um, Barney, I think you, you're... We haven't heard from you for a while. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been talking in my head. I guess. Um, yeah, the demonization of the of the LRA. I think I think that's the point I was I was attempting to make. Is that uh, it's it's easy to say war criminal, uh, abductor of children, and so forth, and and that allows us to stop grappling with the problem because we've labeled it and put it to one side as something that is other than us. And there's only one solution to it, let the prosecutors deal with it because there can be no peace without justice. So that, so you step back from that. But it's, we, we, we're coming through a history, if, if you span more than 10 years, Africa is slowly recovering from from these <coughs> conditions of conflict yeah. and so forth. And, and, and it's, it's incumbent upon us, however difficult it is, to grapple and to deal with people who have the most serious allegations against them. So it has not been helpful. I'll tell you something. When we started off in Juba, the advice that foreign embassies were getting in, in, in Kampala was that you cannot talk to the LRA because international law forbids it. So everywhere you went, no, we're not coming to Juba because our advice is international law. 
And there's no such thing in, under international law. So I had to write a paper to say, this is nonsense. Which bit of international law? And, and, and that came from human rights groups and those paralysis. You say, no, even if somebody is indicted, you can still discuss with them. If you don't have an opportunity to arrest, you breach no obligations. So, so that's just one small example of, of how the labeling <coughs> Can, can, can short circuit what is a more complex process of, of, of dealing with these individuals. And it's easy to say, no, they're devious and they're never serious about, about talks in the first place. I started talking to Vincent Oti in about October of 2005, here from London by phone, say we want to discuss. Way before the Guatemalans arrived in January, he, they had a clear idea of what the agenda would be, <coughs> what the pitfalls were. He said they didn't trust the government. And, and I said, well, but Museveni is a strong leader, and sometimes you need a strong opponent to discuss with. If you win the argument, you can be sure. <coughs> and, and we're having this discussion. It wasn't, he didn't need to, I wasn't anybody. He didn't need to lie to me about it. That's why I, I still believe that they did think about a peace process. And they wanted to find a way of engaging with the government <laughs> without, without becoming um, uh, vulnerable in, in, in the process. The religious element, that's a difficult one. I think that when, uh, when the LRA started, uh, you, you will recall that after, after the 70s taking power, there's Alice Lakwena. And, and, and she was able to gather people around her. It, it was a state of crisis in northern Uganda. A lot of people had been driven from their homes. And, and, and the society was, to be frank, lost. People were in fleeing in exile. And they were afraid. The NRA was advancing. So the society dug within itself. Alice Laguena came, filled the vacuum. And, and, and people gathered around, around her. Joseph Korn then filled another vacuum. And young people remained around him. And, and that has gone on, and he has drawn on, on, on that spirituality. Uh, it's, it's difficult to understand, but it's a potent element. And, and if you ignore it, that, then you are, you are sidestepping uh, a, a very important feature of, of, of what, the, what the LRA is. So if you take the LRA seriously, you have to understand, understand Kony's appeal and his charisma. And that is also tied up with, uh, with, with, with his own beliefs. Um, Aneka, um, demonization, uh, spiritual values, popular, what accounts for their continuing mm. existence, success, popularity, whatever? I mean, I, I don't think it's helpful to label, I, to label anyone a monster, uh, just because we all have within us the capacity for a lot of good, and we all have within us, I think, the capacity for a lot of, a lot of evil and, and terrible deeds. I do think it is important for us to be clear when crimes against humanity, war crimes, or worse, are being committed. And I think we need to say that. And of course, one has to be able to document the responsibility of that. But I think we mustn't shy away from that. When serious crimes are being committed, it is not, I think, the role of human rights organizations or of anyone else to try and paper that over. Does that mean that the arrests of such individuals, and here we've got three left in the LRA, that the arrest will, should they be arrested? Uh, they are wanted by international arrest warrants. Will that lead to peace on an, in and of itself in northern Uganda? I don't think so. So it has to be part of something much, much more than that. It's part of a much bigger process. And I, I think sometimes this debate has come down to the simple, yes, we arrest them, or no, we don't arrest them. And there's so much more underneath, so much of what we've been talking about, about a process that perhaps wasn't actually a process addressing some of the issues. Um, so I don't think we should label them as monsters, but I do think we have to be clear about when crimes are being committed. Uh, on the role of the church, I, I think that is one that is worth considering perhaps a, a bit more. And I, I think also not only have we sometimes got caught into this difficulty of does one talk to war criminals. I, I mean, I do think if we're serious about the International Criminal Court and about international justice, we should see that as slightly different from other things. It's broader than just Uganda. Um, but I think there's also been this difficulty of we don't talk to terrorists, right? The whole kind of um, U.S. administration on this. And I don't think that has necessarily been very helpful. And we've got to find a way of, of dealing with that more, with more nuances. Yes. 
P Peter, demonization, spiritual well, I, I think that's an excellent point, and you're right. Uh, and a lot of this demonization is a result of the media. Because uh, we, you know, it, we in the media are compelled to make things either black or white. These guys are good, these guys are bad. And as we all know, any of us who've worked in the field for any period of time, there's a lot of gray out there. And uh, unfortunately, given time constraints and space restraints, uh, we don't always make those distinctions. Uh, but again, I, you know, I, again, I'm agreeing with Annika. It's like we still have, we cannot forget that some very serious crimes have been committed over decades. And uh, I also want to just make another point. It's like I agree also that this is not an issue or question between uh, peace or justice. Uh, the two have to go hand in hand. I think saying we can only have one or the other is a diversionary tactic to get people to think to forget about the real seriousness of this issue. Why is Coney and the LRA, why have they been indicted? Why were they the first indictments to be issued by the ICC? And what about all the other people who have been indicted? And we currently have Thomas Lubanga from the DRC on trial. We have a couple more militia leaders about to go on trial. Let's put, let's capture Coney, let's put him on trial, let's look at the evidence and make a rational, you know, humane decision. Period. I, Joseph, uh, what do you think? Coney on trial? Uh, demonization? Uh, demonization. Uh, no, it's, um, it, 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 just like everybody else has said, I, I don't think it's necessarily in, in a helpful one. Of course, the word itself is, is rather a, a bad word. But, um, you know, the problem is, and, and I'm not really quite sure how much I've gotten, the problem is that as far as Africa is concerned, and Mike, of course, you've been there for some time, um, is that. Uh, where really do we begin on this thing, questions of justice? You know, where do we begin? And when do we begin? Do we begin in 2002? Do we begin in 1987? Do we begin with the Boers in South Africa? Do, do, we, do, 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 do we sort out the UNITA guys who are now doing quite well in Luanda, in Angola? Where do we begin? You know, so generally, it's really not helpful. And for, for me, who got myself into becoming a tiny little media expert through being a victim, you know, I saw untrust many of these other things when immediately one time you're doing business with Saddam and he's a, he's a gentle giant and tomorrow, you know, uh, these horrible guys. And the other day, Jonas Sivindi, Robert, Robert Reagan says, you know, you know, he's, he's, he's a cool guy, you know. And um, in my own case, in, in, in Uganda, Idi Amin comes and, you know, the British, yeah. the British guys called him a gentry giant, a gentry yeah. giant, <laughs> you know. Mm. And Museven was at one stage called a new breed, of, a mm. new breed, I, I don't know what it is. So, so which is which? In Uganda, and I think this is part of the problem, Patrick, we need to deal with this problem yep. by bringing all of us in together. If we say Kony is a killer, how many people have killed? And I think there's a point which I didn't really make before. Um, we, we have a position. My party has got a position, which um, um, no other party in Uganda has picked. Um, we want to buy from South Africans the National Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Mm. I went and lobbied over it with my late president, and in 2005, we tabled it at the, the, first, uh, the first semblance of a uh, 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 national conference which was allowed for political parties in Uganda. So you'd use the same we, principles. Uh, essentially, if Cohen pr confesses all, makes a clean breast of it, amnesty for life. My, my, my vi well, uh, <laughs> amnesty for coin. Maybe something you know, to think no, about. No, it really doesn't. Well, <laughs> amnesty for coin. Uh, you know, amnesty for coin is good. I'm just simply saying that um, it really doesn't help because I think the point Mike was saying was that uh, maybe we call coin a killer. But or do we call him a liberator? But there are other people who calling Museveni a killer. But th uh, that's the point. And where do we stop it? Yeah. So really, it doesn't help, for yeah. sure. The language doesn't help. Okay. Um, we're a bit pressed for time, unfortunately. Um, what would be quite good. I, mean, I think we've, we've, we've had quite a few representatives or speakers on behalf of the LRA. Uh, is anyone here want, want to say, well, you know, failing if, if you don't, but fine. Does <laughs> anyone want to sort of put, put the point of view of the Ugandan government? No one seems to really be very very impressed by their performance. Otherwise, you know, just any questions we, for, to the panel, uh, you know, drawing their expertise. Uh, uh, lady there uh, with the purple. Cynthia Patrick from Conciliation uh, Resources. Thank just you. a little yeah. point of detail. Yeah. I'm mean, not an expert, but I uh, just wanted to say that the TRC in South Africa did not exclude 
prosecution for serious crimes, so not everybody was amnestied. Uh, I, I think, but if, if you did actually tell the truth, <laughs> you, you, uh, you could get off. No, no, for, but, for serious apply. crimes, you for could serious. still be prosecuted, even if you told okay. the truth. Okay. So, so that's the model it's an you'd option. recommend. Yeah. Yeah. Just okay. this little no. detail. Patrick, no, then no wonder, just to say, no wonder Museven is not very keen on it, because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because of course, someone would right. catch up with him, too. Okay. Um, <laughs> gentleman straight behind. Yeah. Um, Steve Elliott, I'm a, an analyst. Um, given the difficulty of running uh, an insurgency or a guerrilla war for as long as Tony has done. Um, given that he's rampaged across four African countries inflicting fairly substantial civilian casualties, which is against most of the tenets of guerrilla warfare, um, wouldn't one, would one want to ascribe his motives to internal Ugandan issues, or is he part of a larger uh, picture in the region and is he, in fact, a proxy for somebody else? And if so, who does the panel think he's operating? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any more strictly questions at this stage? Uh, la lady in the second row. Hi, Zoe Flood. I'm a freelancer, formerly of International Crisis Group. I have two short questions. Firstly, I'd be interested in the panel's view on the US's role in the military operation in December. And secondly, referring to the um, December crisis group report about a subsection of the LRA, which they refer to as LRA Sudan. I'd be interested on, in the panel's views as whether there is a subgroup within the LRA that is predominantly South Sudanese and that their situation is, is so different that it needs to be addressed in a different way. Okay, thanks. Uh, any more? Question, gentlemen, right at the back, uh, in the blue sort of shirt. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to make a quick um, question, uh, and that just regards uh, probably um, uh, the problem with the LRA in the region. Is it really the LRA that is the problem in the region, or the problem also suffers from some serious structural problems? Because over the last few years, there's been nearly almost seven million deaths around the region. And obviously, it's not all been attributed to LRA. Mm -hmm. Some of the problems actually are being probably perpetrated from somewhere else for whatever reasons. Yeah. Okay. And I think probably some people really have to be looked after very carefully. And one of them definitely is Museveni. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Um, right. Is that, yeah. um, I think we'll just let's have one round now and just see what, how much left we've got, uh, time we've got left. I don't think very much, unfortunately. Uh, Barney, we've got sort of four, four questions. The LRA is a proxy for whom? U.S. involvement in the December failed military operation. Is there such an L a thing as the LRA Sudan? And lastly, the gentleman's point was, uh, you know, why is this part of, uh, part of the world so deadly? Why have so many people died in this part of the world? I think it's... it's you, 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 go back, you, you go back to the borders that are arbitrary and state formation and the concept of nationhood and, and, and different groups, whether they have a stake in, in what happens in the center, mm. uh, that, 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 that has bred conflict. Yeah. And, and you have to cure those structural problems. Kinshasa is too far from Ituri. There's mm. just no way Joseph Kabila has much of a hold there. Sure. But you know, he, they need to find a formula for mm for holding it together and and may, maybe with regionalization within East Africa rather than thinking in terms of ethnicities and nationalities that think things might improve. So yes, there is a problem, but it is it is soluble and, mm. and, and only soluble uh, incrementally and right. through political processes and economic growth and, 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 uh, and that kind of intervention. I, I don't know about an LRA Sudan. My own impression is that the LRA is is, is highly centralized. I, I don't see it as a factional mm. group, right. so I'd be surprised that any LRA okay. is acting autonomously. Right. If, if they are, they're a different group to mm -hmm. to Joseph Kony's LRA. The, the the U.S. role, it's it's the last superpower standing, so it's mm. always going to have an impact on these kinds of discussions. It will have its own agenda. Uh, what it often translates into, and, and, and in the negotiations, uh, e even taking the points about its weaknesses, is that uh, 
people were negotiating with a gun on their heads and 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 the stop clock. Yeah. And whereas whereas negotiations are about sitting down, going back and forth, the rhetoric, some of which you've you've, right. you've heard tonight. Uh, but but mm. underneath all of that, you can mm. actually have. A, a real conversation. You, right. you, you can have admissions, you can have concessions being made. People don't want to be humiliated. Uh, right. If we rush it, uh, then, then it, it ends up being stark and one side doesn't feel able to, uh, to, to proceed with it. There's been some issue about, about, about truth and, and reconciliation. That is, that's an important discussion, but it, it was on the table in Juba. There, there, there is draft and language on a TRC that needs to be established in Uganda and people appointed independently in a, in a process that is political. But that needs to be a, a, a political process Indeed. within the country as well. And, and it cannot just be imposed on a timetable externally. So, so those thoughts are happening in Uganda and, and, they, and certainly discussing the past um, is, is, is the way to go. I'm not sure about truth commissions and, and, and how how they function um, in, in, in Uganda, but, but it's, it's worth trying. But the other point is that, is, is that uh, under the Juba agreements is a commitment to prosecutions apart from the, 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 the Truth Commission yeah. activities. Right. Thanks um, very much. Uh, uh, Aneka, can I get your comments on those? And then I'll come back to you, Banu, right at the end, but uh, just tagged on to those questions, because we're short. Can you just sort of give us a couple of pointers? You think things that could be done peace talks, security, UN involvement, whatever, that can really, because we all think, agree that the LRA is in business, this conflict is going to rage in U northern Uganda, probably Congo, pro probably southern Sudan, and it's going to get worse. Can you just come up with a couple of pointers as things you think that should be done, as well as answering the questions? And not sure. a tall order. But. Yeah. Well, on, in terms of answering the questions, actually, I agree with just about everything that, that Barney's just said uh, about that I'll give maybe just a few more details on the on the U.S. involvement mm. because uh, certainly what you say you know this, the, the the stopwatch was on and, and obviously they wanted to move to the to the next phase if the peace talks were were going to fail. Um, it's it's also clear they provided more substantial support for this operation. So they provided intelligence, financial backing, and logistical uh, technical know-how for the operation. You know, that's absolutely clear. And so I think when we're looking for solutions, the US has a role to now also help find solutions on all of this. It is kind of the last superpower standing. It has significant influence over the, uh, the government of Museveni. We need that to be used. Um, it also, of course, has significant influence, uh, at least in parts of Sudan and in DRC. And, and they need to, I think, help us now find solutions to some of these problems. I think from a very practical perspective now, um, we're in this difficult situation where it's uncertain what's happening next, but there's one certainty here, which is that the people of northern Congo are today without protection. So, you know, a Congolese government army that um, has not been very effective in the past, that tends to prey on its people. They've actually not been too bad in northern Congo so far, so I, I do want to emphasize that, but I don't hold out much hope that that will continue. So I think some serious questions need to be asked about what is the UN's mission in Congo, Monuk's role now in northern Congo, what can they do to help provide protection for the people who live there, similarly with the UN in southern Sudan. I don't think the UN is the answer here, mm. by, by any means. You know, I think we've all seen far too many failures across the region. Um, of the of the United Nations, but I think we do need to look much more carefully about protection of civilians uh, on all of this. And I, I think these underlying issue, which so many of you have been talking about tonight, uh, we need to find a process to deal with that. And uh, I don't think it's as simple as going back to the Juba process. You've highlighted the difficulties in that, so have you. So I think let's go back to the table and think about s some of those issues. Um, I think the other thing that has to continue is pressure on the LRA in a wide variety of different forms to stop its human rights abuses. I know we've heard talks this evening or comments this evening that they're not carrying out abuses. I'm afraid to say that the evidence does not bear that out. The evidence is that children continue to be abducted and people continue to be killed and that's the LRA combatants who are responsible. And the people of northern Congo have suffered, the people of Congo have suffered enough <coughs> over the year. We talk about seven million dead the vast majority in Congo. It's a non-functioning state, and the LRA is taking advantage of that. Okay. Oh. Okay, a very brief one. Yeah. A very Mr. Brief Chairman, one. thank you, Mr. Chairman and the House. 
It gives me tremendously great pleasure to thank you all for having come to this meeting. I have not been given an, an opportunity to speak. It is understandable, Mr. Chairman. The point is this, and I want to make it abundantly clear. My name is John Baptist Ayala, a permanent resident in the United Kingdom. I'm grateful to the British government and the British people for giving me the opportunity to live in their country and to be able to speak yes. in a country that recognizes the significance of democracy. Fine. Uh, we also have to recognize the uh, time. Actually, thank you. Now, now, Mr. Chairman, I go away with tremendously deep pain in my heart. I am the victim of genocide. I've known the pain of genocide since 1971 when Idi Amin overthrew the first UPC government. Okay, but I, am the, I am the nephew of Lieutenant Colonel Abuela. He knows him very well, him, Banaba Safako. I am the son of Lieutenant Colonel, Abu, the, the, the brother of Lieutenant Colonel Abuela. He knows no. Brigadier Kili, his father, who was the Minister of Education when Idi Amin was in okay. power. Can, can you get to I am pain that he is capable uh, we, of we, we condoning talk, the kind of lies being perpetrated. Yeah. Now, Mr. Chairman, may I kindly request you to use your influence to organize, or rather to facilitate a forum where a thorough diagnosis of the fundamental issues in northern Uganda can be thoroughly and thoroughly discussed. Well, because I'm so ashamed that a person like this young lady and this, 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 this gentleman Sorry. are capable of Perpetrating well, I, I, I can assure horrifying you. lies. Thanks. Very, Horrif very, very a good lawyer, point. A lawyer, a lawyer, I don't know which university you attend. <laughs> yeah. Because if the essence of university <laughs> I mean, education let's, is let's, the process of truth, yeah. and you are yeah. capable of such I hopeless <laughs> lies, yeah. I'm so okay. ashamed. I am so Thank ashamed. You. Thank you. Yeah. Please, no, we will. please, please, let us hear the real Okay, we, 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 we no, hear no, the... No, 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 okay. Uh, sir, we, we, we hear... We, yeah, no, 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 I hear exactly what you're saying. No, no you made your point. You made your point. Need, <laughs> we, we see the need. Thank you so much. And I assure you we're going to have the forum that you're looking for. And, and we're going to try and... But, you know, I think the, the point we're all looking for is let's take it somewhere constructive. Um, Peter and Joseph. So final call. No, no. Okay, well, let, let's talk afterwards and we'll have your forum. And, so if you have anything else to say, I'm here. I'm going to ask a question for funny. Okay. You can check your papers. Fine, fine, you. fine. Uh, Peter uh, and Joseph. Uh, Peter, uh, again, any points you've got on the on the questions, uh, the proxy and the uh, LRA Sudan and, and, and so on, and, and then, but more importantly, I think, you know, your, your prescriptions, a few pointers for where we go from here, what can be done useful, that's useful, that can, that can protect the people and get to some sort of resolution of this conflict. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm coming off as a militaristic kind of guy, because I'm not. No, uh, I, can, but I, I can vouch for that. So <laughs> <laughs> some of the, uh, uh, but I think what, what's coming to the fore here is that there's uh, a lot of widespread er, er, frustration has been building yeah. over a long yeah. time that there's been no solution to this LRA problem. And unfortunately, we're looking at the absolutely distinct prospect of this continuing on into the future uh, until, you know, we don't know when it will end, and it, it can only get worse, and, and from my point of view. So I think that's why some people keep coming back to this military solution. And being an American, it pains me personally to, to see that, you know, Americans are looked at as the bad guys. You know, we're the junkyard dogs in every situation, which is a ridiculous situation to be in. Um, unfortunately, that's the way it is. The way forward, um, I think, is that we have a mechanism set up with the International Criminal Court. We already have uh, a number of militia leaders on trial, in cap, in, in cap, have been captured. They're, and I think that's the process as a society, a global society, that we need to follow. Let's gather the evidence. Let's put people on trial. Uh, I think the ICC is a huge step forward for humanity. And let's, let's work with it. Let's use it. Thank you. Thank you. Jo Joseph. Yeah. Uh, if you concentrate on the way forward, the constructive yeah. way forward, what, what, what do we need to do? No, I, I think, um, as, as, you, as, you, as you just suggest, that um, the experience this evening alone suggests that um, um, there are huge boils um, in Uganda, mm -hmm. that republic, and there are huge boils amongst Ugandan communities. And I think I, I say with a strong heart, as a political representative, 
that there is a huge amount of polarization in our country. Yeah. And um, um, we need help uh, to, to, to help resolve that. But part of our experience, though, is that for a very long time, um, instead of being helped, we've actually found the much more the fuel being sort of like added into it. Um, but since this world is changing, I think uh, um, um, Bunny was uh, making reference to the fact that up to 10 years ago, we had these, um, Africa was really a place of war. And whenever I talk to people these days, I keep on telling them that, well, we are having fudged elections, but at least it's better than having the, mil the, the idiot means coming mm -hmm. and overthrowing democratic governments, you know, mm -hmm. two, two months to, to multiple elections, and then the, the dictators just fly into London for tea with the Queen, things like that. So at least those kind of things, we can say that there, there, is, there is some hope. Mm -hmm. But I think really at hand here is the fact that um, we don't know how many Ugandans and other Africans in Congo today um, will successfully wake up tomorrow. Mm. In uh, northern Uganda, we don't know how many children today are going to sleep outside the streets of Gulu. Two years after we started the talking, we still have a huge number of people. The vast majority of people are still in concentration camps. There is still very little movement towards giving people uh, an element of hope and moving towards, the, 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 towards their home. I think somebody mentioned in the, in, in, in the floor, I don't remember who, I think somebody was talking about land. Mm. Uh, there is already now a huge politics about land to the mm. extent that um, Ugandans have got every reason to be suspicious enough to say that, well, this game was really not about coin. This game yeah. was really not about ritual, it's about land. How do we move forward? I really don't know. I'm, I'm pleased to have uh, uh, an American here uh, who genuinely believes that uh, America can be a force for good. I know America yeah. can be a force for good. And I happen to be one of those people who is a good friend of many Afri uh, Americans, including a brother to the current American president. You know, um, <laughs> right. he, he's actually my cousin the other side of the border. Um, <laughs> it, America should use its might mm. not to go and make judgment, but to create an enabling environment in which all of us return to the okay. peace process. The international community is not going to stay away from these issues as they get uh, spread around the region. Uh, and, and I suspect that will continue, but it has to be managed and, and, and there's just got to be more nuance about it. And, and we have to be committed to ending the violence uh, be, because of its impact and because of not only today's victims, but yesterday's victims, mm -hmm. and all for future generations. So I think I think we have to go back. But restarting the dialogue, but doesn't necessarily. Mm. You, you, you have to you, ha you have to keep the channels open. Mm. Is, is, is the mm. way I will put it. If 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 we start an artificial uh, process of, of, of dialogue, we go back the old cycle of when does it finish <coughs> yeah. and what will it achieve. Let let let's keep. Those, those, the, the, those channels open and, and try to persuade belligerents uh, to, 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 to cease and, and, and to take the political path. It's, mm. it's hard mm. work. There is no quick fix. But, 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 but no that's signs way. yet that that's happening or possible right now from what you can see. And I, I, think, I think that the parties will go back to, mm. <coughs> to dialogue yeah. because over the last 20-something years, it's not been perfect, but mm. after fighting, they've come back. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's, it's not ended well, but I, we, let's, let's keep hoping and trying that, uh, that the next round w w will have lessons on the back of it and important lessons we can draw on and we can advance this, this process. And of course, in the meantime, civilians, wherever they are, need to be protected robustly. I think that's, that, that, that is part of the we response. We like the forces to do that to right this. now. Yes. Well, well, thanks. Thanks so much, Barney. Thanks for all of you, and thanks for all of the audience. Um, we've left on a note of hoping and trying, um, which at least is a start, but there's an awful lot more to be done, and I hope, you know, I, I think as, uh, as Lady pointed out and other people pointed out, perhaps a forum on the northern Uganda situation, because there are a lot of questions, and nothing, well, they're part of to, partly to do with the conflict, but fundamental socio-political and economic issues about northern Uganda and the need for development there and how that could help the process could be addressed. I think, you know, it, you know maybe you know, there's ground to have to get everyone back together and a lot more other people to, to look at it constructively from that point of view. But in the meanwhile, thanks very much for coming. And uh, if you haven't had your chance to ask your questions, do come up to the panelists afterwards. I'm sure they'd be willing to, uh, to engage with you. Thanks very much for coming. And uh, let's hope 
hoping and trying are going to yield some results in the months ahead. Thank you. Thank you.